Hello, BookTube. I've got a tag for you today on this blustery Friday, and it's tag marmalated in guilt, <laughs> because I somehow missed an event on BookTube in April. Missed it completely, even though I subscribed to the channels involved and watched the videos announcing it and talking about it. Somehow, the penny never dropped. Somehow, I never made the connection. Of, oh, this is something real. You should participate in this and talk all about it. <laughs> the... the uh, the event was reading children's picture books in April. Uh, and it was created by uh, Shelley Swearingen and Jack at Spread Book Joy. And I just ignored it for the month of April. And I have no idea why. I love children's picture books. Love them. I've talked about them enormously on this channel. But I, I let it go. So in order at least to dip a toe in the waters before it disappears completely, I thought I would do the tag that they made up. They made up a tag called the Picture This Book Tag. Uh, and it's all about... Well, it's, it's basic book and reading questions. Uh, you don't have to answer with picture books. I have a bunch of props here uh, because I, I want to do some answering with picture books. Uh, but some of the pictures I, I couldn't, or some of the questions I couldn't answer with picture books, and some of the questions I couldn't answer at all. <laughs> so let's go on. Let's start with the uh, with the first one. Love You Forever, written by Robert Munch with illust and illustrated by Sheila McGraw. I'm sure you all know the book. Uh, name a book you imagine you'll love forever. Now, when it comes to children's picture books, I have an answer to this. And I want to save it for last. I want to end this tag with that. So we're going to move right on to question number two. Uh, question number two is Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, Very Bad Day, written by uh, Judith Fjorst and illustrated by Ray Cruz. I'm, I'm pausing here because I'm just reading that question. I'm thinking, isn't there an adjective missing from that? Uh, well, anyway, uh, uh, which book or comforting things do you turn to when you're having a bad day. Now, here I want to clarify in a, my usual uh, nitpicky way that when I'm having a bad day, I usually go to Frida. I usually don't go to books. Uh, I go to the Bean instead, who's uh, very seldom having a bad day and was almost always able to pull me out of mine. But I have a book. I, I have my props here. I have a book that is guaranteed to make me feel good, which is kind of associated with the prompt, right? And it's this. It's Barn Dance. Uh, this is uh, by Bill Martin Jr. and John Archambault with illustrations by the great Ted Rand. And it's a children's book that just begs to be read out loud. In fact, it begs almost to be sung. It's written in a very sing-songy rhythm about uh, a skinny kid uh, on a farm. Look at how Ted Rand does moonlight. <clears throat> it's just incredible. The actual color palette here is gold, but because of the contrast with the blues and the shades of blue, it really does feel like moonlight just incredible there's a skinny kid uh in the farmhouse late at night we, he's he can't sleep because his head's full of dreams like little skinny kids heads always are when he hears the sound of a fiddle coming from the barn and he goes to investigate uh and what he finds in the barn is that the cows and the pigs and the chickens and all are at a barn dance they are dancing to the tune played by the scarecrow who has a fiddle <laughs> And they're dancing like crazy. They're having a ton of fun. Everybody's having a ball. And eventually, uh, they notice the skinny kid, and he does. He dances with them. He dances a hole right through the foot of his stocking. Uh, and it goes on and on, and it's wonderful. Five times, ten times, fifteen, twenty. Now spin once again, and that's a plenty. But the fat little pigs whirled round and round till they got so dizzy they all fell down. But it can't last forever. The owl is watching. The owl is watching as dawn comes up and gives the warning. But the sky was warming up for the coming of the day when the skinny kid heard the night owl say, Morning's coming closer. Morning's coming closer. Magic time is over. Night will soon be gone. The skinny kid runs across the fields as dawn is coming up. He just barely makes it past the old hound dog who's stretching and waking up after a night's sleep. And he makes it to his bed. Uh, but he's, he's still dreaming. Uh, he hummed a little dosy -si do and flopped himself in bed with wonders of the barn dance, dancing in his head. And there you see the hole in the stocking because he can't, he can't quite forget the magic there. And that is just, that picks me up every single time. So, so that's going to be my answer to that one. Now, what's, what's the next prompt? What's the next prompt? Um, number three is Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle. Which book slash series slash character sparked your hunger for reading. And this was going to be a problem. I was going to pass on this. There are a couple of questions I'm going to have to pass on or get all nitpicky about. 
uh, part of my love of reading, my love of reading, I don't know if it was an individual book, but it was sparked by the ancient Greeks, by the person who sparked my love of reading. He, he used the ancient Greeks to do that, and especially Homer's Iliad. Uh, and at, so at first I thought, well, well that's not going to work, because you don't have a picture book of the Iliad. There probably are really good ones, but I don't have one. And then I remembered that I do. I have a very special picture book of the Iliad. I have this. <laughs> this was made. This is one of a kind. There are no other copies of this book. And this is was made by my surly houseboy when he was just, uh, when we had newly, Deb and I had newly thawed him from his alien crutch pod. <laughs> B is for Briseis. <laughs> it's a it's a what is this called a collage he made this there's uh diomedes d this slowly takes you through the iliad uh <laughs> this is a kind of believe it or not the, the not every page has uh has dialogue but this is believe it or not a kind of collage visual that does sort of cover the story of the iliad uh and uh, does so in just a handful of pages, so th that counts. <laughs> that definitely counts. Uh, so there you go. I get to I get to include the Iliad. Uh, prompt number four is Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. What's the most unusual book you've ever read? This is one of the questions I'm going to have to pass on. Uh, I, I for good or ill, whether you agree with me or not, I don't believe there are any unusual books. So we're just going to rather than than chase down that that rabbit, we're just going to move on. Uh, number five is Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. Uh, what is your favorite? book featuring the natural world uh and i have there are quite a few of them the big snow is one there's there's one where a father and his child go out looking for great horned owl at night wonderful stuff but i picked one that is extra enjoyable it features the natural world in a way <laughs> it also features the human world and it's this it's diary of a wombat by jackie french the pictures here are by bruce watley and this is the story of uh a wombat. Uh, <laughs> it's very simply told, there are hardly any backgrounds. I'm a wombat. I live in Australia. As you can see from my picture, I look a little like a bear, but smaller. I live in a hole in the ground. I come out mostly at night, and during the day I sleep, I eat grass and roots, and of course, the occasional treat. And then we get a breakdown of the wombat's day. Monday, slept. Afternoon, slept. Evening, ate grass. <laughs> Scratch. Night. Eight grass. <laughs> That's all we get is, is slept. This is all we get is what the wombat's doing. But the wombat's world uh, is is uh, impinged on by suburbanites. <laughs> and the wombat starts uh, invading their world. <laughs> uh, afternoon, mild, cloudy day. I have new neighbors. Humans found the perfect dust bath. Discovered flat, hairy creature invading my territory. Fought major battle with flat, hairy creature. Won battle. Neighbors should be pleased. Demanded a reward. It's the welcome mat. <laughs> the wombat fights an epic battle with the welcome mat, and the treat that the wombat demands is carrots. <laughs> that evening, received a carrot. It was delicious. Demanded more carrots. No response. <laughs> <laughs> and it just continues from there. The wombat just bedevils this family uh, for for carrots, and it's delightful. As I guess that counts as the natural world, doesn't it? <laughs> I would assume that it does. Uh, let's see here. Prompt number six is "Good Night Moon" by Margaret Wise Brown. Uh, do you read at bedtime? Do you read to someone else at bedtime? Did anyone ever read to you at bedtime? Wonderful questions. Absolutely wonderful. Bedtime is a little bit equivocal for me. I, I sleep a lot less than you do and often wave it completely if I'm all caught up in reading, which is what I do at night. At midnight, I turn into a pumpkin. I do a lot of reading during the day as well, but at night, I shut off the world completely. At, back in the olden days, that meant I turned off and unplugged the radio and I unplugged the phone from the jack on the wall so that nothing could reach me, nothing at all. Uh, and everyone that I've known in my whole life has known that is, you know, no man's land. It, at midnight, I'm, the door is closed and I'm reading and I don't want to be bothered uh, for anything, for any reason at all. Uh, and nowadays, the, the, of course, the world is far more intrusive. It wants more of your time. It wants to be part of you at all times. So nowadays at midnight, you know, there's no phone jack anymore. There's no landline anymore. There's no radio anymore. But there is there are devices. Uh, I do... 
anyway, what I advise all the rest of you to do, absolutely, which is turn off all notifications on all of your devices at all times. Not just at midnight, but ever. Your, your devices should not be speaking to you. <laughs> that, that conditions your brain to respond, and you're helpless against that conditioning. So don't do it. Don't have the notifications on. But in addition to that, I also put away the technology. Just put it away so that I'm reading. The only difference being nowadays that I actually read on a piece of technology. I read on a Kindle uh, often. Sometimes the evening will involve uh, you know, paper and ink books. I'm, which case they're the only things me and the bean and reading. Uh, so is that bedtime? Well, I don't really know. I mean, it's nighttime <laughs> anyway. I, I don't often go to bed is what I'm saying, but, but, but yes, the answer is definitely yes. If it means do you read at night, do you read in bed after the world has gone quiet and after everyone else around you has started to go to sleep? That is definitely true. Uh, and then what was the other one? Um, do you read to someone at bedtime? Occasionally, if I'm reading, on the bed with the bean or with my dogs, you know, uh, endless dogs throughout history. Uh, and I encounter something that either wants to be read out loud. Maybe I'm reading some piece of prose. Uh, when did this, when did that happen? Uh, well, there were, there were long stretches in the dying grass by William Volman that I wanted to read out loud. There was one particular on, incredibly harrowing passage in Larry Kramer, one of his The Brutality of Fact. Uh, I read a long passage, almost a whole chapter, out of the Goldbug Variation by Richard Powers out loud to a bed covered in beagles. <laughs> there, was, there weren't two, there weren't three, there was just covered in beagles. They were, you know, every, everybody was sleeping, but everybody was also always ratcheting and, and recalibrating around each other. Because if you had looked at that bed and said, if you'd looked at that bed without me being on the bed, you'd have said no human can possibly fit on this bed, much less stay all night on this bed. But it's entirely possible. <laughs> it's the way I prefer. A big crowded bed is the way I prefer. I don't have it now. I have a tiny little dust moat of a dog. But that's not a hardship. <laughs> Believe you me, you humans think it is. But for dogs, that's not a hardship. To read, in, to to sleep all night or or lounge around all day in a gigantic interconnected mosaic of living flesh is heaven itself. Uh, but sometimes, the Goldbug Variations, when I was reading that, I read a whole chapter almost of that out loud to my dogs. Sometimes what I'm reading calls for that. Really does. Sometimes the prose just calls for that. And I will. Because thanks to the situation that I have set up, there's never anybody else. I, I, am, I am by myself. I am concentrating on reading. So I don't have to worry about inconveniencing anybody. Uh, and did anyone ever read to you at bedtime? I am probably guessing not. <laughs> I didn't sleep. So, you know, I, I I didn't sleep and I also wasn't interested at all. I was surrounded by dogs at bedtime. In what I'm assuming here is implying childhood. I was surrounded by dogs. So I, I didn't, I, having anybody read to me, <laughs> I, I wanted I wanted to be part of that living mosaic that's you know, if I move a little, then everybody else has to shift a little, and people people don't even wake up fully from from doing that. Those of you who, do, who have ever seen this or live with it will know what I'm talking about. It's a joy, an absolute joy. It's the I don't no offense to Frida, but it's it's something that I very much miss. Having a bed covered in dogs is something I very much miss. Uh, but that had no that had no connection with reading at bedtime. So no, I'm going to guess no to that last one. Uh, and the next one is number seven is Guess How Much I Love You by Sue by Sam McBratney and illustrated by Anita Jaram. Who had the biggest influence on you as a reader? I had one teacher. It has to be him. I had one teacher who opened my eyes to what reading is, to the wonder of it, uh, to the infinite possibilities of it, the infinite adventure of it, the genuine adventure that it is, the genuine fun that it is. He opened my eyes to that in all the ways that matter, and it's a debt that I can never repay except to pay it forward. That's the only way that I've ever been able to, to make peace with myself is to because he's long gone. The only way that I can pay that debt is to pay it forward by helping other people to do that same thing, by being a, introducing people to as many books as possible to, in, in hopes that, that they get all fired up about the way he made me get fired all up about uh, then uh, number eight is *The Giving Tree* by Shel Silverstein. Which book or set of books would give and would you give to an emerging reader, or which book have you given as a gift 
uh, more than once. Uh, emerging readers i would have to go on a case-by-case -case basis there's no there's no set in stone book but given as a gift there is a kid's book that i have given as a gift countless times literally i have no idea how many times i have given copies of this book away uh it's a famous children's book it's a boston children's book it's make way for ducklings i have a couple of different editions of this thing i grab it whenever i see it in a used bookstore and i give it away quite a bit this is a paperback i have a larger hardcover that i like uh, but this is a story of a duck family that, that decides to make a home in Boston. <laughs> and they, uh, they originally try for uh, uh, the Brownstones, and that's way too busy. Then they, they try for an island in the river, but that's way too busy. Uh, and then they try for uh, the swan boats. And it works, and they have a family. And it's, it's the, the mother duck and her ducklings have honorary statues in Boston to them. This has been given and read and commemorized a million times. I love it. Absolutely love it. I never tire of reading it, even for myself, much less giving it as a gift to other people. So so I'm, I'm going to include that for, uh, for a gift. Uh, and that brings us to the end, but we're going to end with number one, uh, which was now Love You Forever, written by Robert Munch and illustrated by Sheila McGraw. Name a book you imagine you'll love forever. And when it comes to children's picture books, I have an example. I've praised it on this channel many times before, but I'm not going to pass up an opportunity to praise it again. It's this. It's written by uh, Eve Bunting with illustrations by David Christiana, and it's I Am the Mummy Heb Nefert. And it's about uh, a young girl who dances for the prince. And uh, I danced one evening for the pharaoh's brother, Ty. My pleated linen robe swayed gentle at my every step. The circlet on my head gleamed with its jeweled light. My eyes, my hands gave promises of bliss that made him weak. And soon he loved me. I was a cherished wife. The palace was my home. I lived for him and he for me. And she is made beautiful. And you notice the cone of scented wax on her head. The Egyptians would do that. And as it melted, it would... It would melt into your hair, but it would also scent you and give you a little, uh, little relief from the heat. Uh, she travels up the Nile with her lord. Uh, he throws sticks at crocodiles. Uh, she uh, looks, they look at their reflection in the water. The dragonflies, it's beautiful artwork. Uh, we'd wander in the gardens, he and I, beside the pleasure lake where lotus blossoms grew. The servant girls would come on soundless feet and bring us fruit, grapes, dates, and figs. The baskets balanced on their heads, a cloth of linen spread beneath a canopy that kept us from the sun, and we would feast while Harpus played. Uh, and uh, it changes. Eventually, Hebnefer dies, as does her lord. Uh, uh, eventually, it changes. I rose above myself and watched. I watched as they anointed me with oils and spices took away the parts of me that were inside and filled me up with natron, cinnamon, and herbs. My eyes were closed and plugged. Beeswax filled my nose. They capped my nails with gold, studded with precious stones, bejeweled me from head to toe, and bound me up in linen, layer upon layer. I was to be for all eternity, well kept for him, her prince. Uh, and then time passes. And in incomprehensible amount of time an incomprehensible amount time passed and time dark time and years till we were found our bodies moved placed under glass coffins under lights in quiet rooms i rose above myself and watched as people came they peered into the cases where we lay they spoke with words unknown to me but understood as they were said was this a person this and this? How foolish that they do not see how all things change, and so will they. Three thousand years from now, they will be dust and bones. I am the mummy, Heb Nefert, black as night, stretched as tight as leather on a drum. Once, I was beautiful. <laughs> That's amazing. Utterly amazing. Not sure what a kid will get out of it, but I love it. Absolutely love it. So I'm going to say that's one that I will love to the end of my days. <laughs> so that that is it. That is the picture of this book tag. Uh, with apologies to, <laughs> with apologies to the, the organizers and creators of this event. I should have been talking about children's books all along. All month long. 
I will try to be more on the ball next year when this event returns. <laughs> In the meantime, I thought I'd show you some great kids' books because I love children's picture books. Absolutely love them. The greatest of them, of course, are for everybody, not just kids. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap this up for now. That is the picture of this book tag. If you haven't done this and you're also likewise guilty, feel free to do it before the end of the month, <laughs> whether this event that we that I accidentally ignored, um, and that I, but that I wholeheartedly support. <laughs> Anyway, I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.